It's pretty easy actually to do that, those uh, antigen tests. Uh, yeah. Pretty quickly. Yeah. Okay. So then let's talk about your strategy because I think that's really the main, uh, mm -hmm. the main point of today's meeting. So look, the, there's really nothing special about Q3 versus the other Qs. Uh, let me actually clarify that a little bit. So as we know, the importance of the different questions on a test is based on their difficulty level, right? The easier it is, the more important it is, the harder it is, the less important it is. Now, there may be some reason to believe that Q3 will tend to have harder questions than Qs 1 and 2. And if that's true, then, then your strategy is a good strategy, right? Because if we have reason to believe that the third quarter has harder questions, then those questions will be less important. And so that's a good quarter to be more aggressive. But then the question is, is that true? Like, do we have reason to believe that the third quarter will have harder questions? And the answer is, well, not really. I mean, it, it really depends, right? If you have a very strong strong Q1 and Q2, then yes, Q3 should, statistically speaking, have much harder questions. But if you had some, let's say, one or two careless mistakes where you picked a trap answer, not realizing it, and you, you, know, you thought you got the first two quarters all correct because you knew all those questions, you knew how to solve them, you picked the answers, you thought they were all correct, but actually a couple of them you picked a trap answer, well, now... Q3 is not as hard as you assumed it would be. Yeah. And so that's the danger with the strategy that you're using. And I think that your definition of aggressively guessing, maybe that's what we need to tweak. Because I define guessing aggressively kind of a bit different. In fact, I don't really have aggressive guessing. I, I have guessing and I have not guessing. Right? It's just uh, binary. So, so Abby, can, you just, can I just share my screen? Because I think uh, yeah. I wanted to discuss what happened in Q. Because I'm pretty sure that's, I think at least that's what it's. Can I just share my be able, screen? You should be able to share now. So if I just open up that email, which I attached. Yeah. So I think what happens is um, because of my experience with mocks, and I think the Manhattan mocks are personally outside of MBA mocks the best because it gives it, it hit me right exactly. I was around the 680 to 700 in the Manhattan mocks, and that's where I ended up in my real exam. Mm -hmm. Whereas in MBA one and two, I was getting like 720 is because I think maybe some of the questions were repetitive or something. But what I notice in my Q4 is I tend to have to speed up in Q4 in my mocks. And I, I, I've done many mocks and I've seen that I, I've, um, I, I'm in my Q4 in verbal, I do have to speed up because, you know, that's just my experience. So in, in knowing that what happens in Q4, that's when I aggressively start to aggressively guess in Q3 because I'd much rather guess a lot faster in Q3 than in Q4. I think that's what I do in Q3. It's not that I realize that the questions are harder or something. I think it's based on difficulty, but given up based on my experience in the mocks, I know I have to really speed up and I get the last three or four questions because the moment you speed up, you start getting more wrong um, answers. So I'd much rather speed up in Q3 and in Q4, I'm completely relaxed for the last set. And that in my view is, that's what happened in my ESR. If, I, if you just see my ESR, um, that drop, and you'll notice it goes back up in the Q4. It's because in my Q4, I'm actually relaxed based on this strategy. When I mean relaxed, I mean, I take my time. I, you know, I start, to, I do what I do in Q1 and Q2 where I um, relax, I take an extra 10 seconds to understand, to pause, to make sure I understand. Whereas in Q3, I, the moment I get a hiccup, I'm like, all right, let's just guess and move on because I'd much rather be cool and calm in Q4 because I, I, I'd want to be on that upslope in Q4 as opposed to be going on that downslope in Q4. That is why I sped up in Q3. Now, 
I, I'm pretty sure that's what happened because um, because even after I do the strategy, I still, and I remember in my Q4, my last question, I only, I finished verbal still on time. So even after doing the strategy of speeding up intentionally in Q3, it's not that I've saved some time or something like that. And I don't know if it's, uh, maybe I'm just not fast enough on the RCs or uh, I'm not sure which, which type of questions I'm not being as, um, I'm taking longer than usual. Mm-hmm. My, I guess it's, um, uh, I, I, if you look at the, it's two minutes. You can't, maybe I guess. No, you, you can't look at that because of your strategy. Right? Your strategy is going to mess up these numbers. And so we can't really make any inferences of that. from yeah. those numbers. Because so, of your strategy, but yeah. look, JD, I'm I'm hearing what you're saying, and I just want to be clear. I'm not suggesting that uh, you should abandon the ag- aggressive guessing in Q3, and that's it. Mm-hmm. I'm not suggesting that because if you do that, then your Q4 will be ruined. Exactly. So that's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm suggesting is that you replace the strategy of what you're doing in Q3 with a different strategy. Okay. okay. That's what I'm suggesting. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Because I, I agree. We really want you to be calm and relaxed in Q4. And we want you to be confident that you have plenty of time to do the best job that you can do in Q4. That's very important. Mm-hmm. How we get there, that's, I think, what we need to tweak. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because using the same strategy and expecting a different outcome is the definition of insanity, right? So we, we have to tweak the strategy, but I'm not suggesting to just abandon it and not replace it with anything else. We need to put something else instead. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but since you have this on the screen, let's, let's talk about this picture that we're looking at right here, because this is an important picture to look at. Um, when you look at Q3, what you see is that you got easy questions wrong right right and that is very hard to recover from like even if you had made no mistakes at all in q4 it wouldn't bring you back i mean if you look at where your green dot is on q2 look at that green dot in q2 so green dot is approximately your uh the gmat's opinion of you at that point so what's the gym, GMAT's opinion of you at, at Q2? It's up there, I would say, yeah, exactly where you're pointing. That's the GMAT's opinion of you at the end of Q2, which is pretty good opinion, uh, especially compared to its opinion of you in Q1. Right? So in Q1, it doesn't know you yet. right? It's just starting to get to know you, and it gave you some really easy questions, and you got all of them right. So you were off to a great start. Uh, but as you can see, it took the GMAT quite a while to start ramping up that difficulty level for you. Even though you got the entire Q1 correct, the average difficulty of those questions in Q1 was really quite low, right? Finally, when you get to Q2, it's starting to give you some hard questions. And you can see that the average, if you scroll down, we'll see how many of the questions you got wrong and how many you got right there. So uh, where do we see that? A little bit lower? Yeah. Or is that actually higher? I don't remember. Might be higher. Just uh-huh. above it, maybe. Ah, there we go. Yeah. So here we see that you had, looks like, nine questions in Q2. And you got uh, f- five right, four wrong. So if you scroll back down a little bit to that picture we were looking at earlier. So the four questions you got wrong in Q2, they were, on average, really hard questions. Truly above your ability level. Right. So these are questions they were they were in Q2. So Q2, you were not guessing aggressively. You were really trying your best. Right. In Q2, you're trying your best. You weren't rushing. You weren't aggressively guessing. But you got almost half the questions wrong in Q2. And that's perfectly fine. Right. That's OK. Where I think your strategy needs to be tweaked. Is with the amount of time that you spent on those four questions that you got wrong in Q2. Now, we, it's hard to say exactly how much time you spent on them, especially since we don't know what kind of questions they were. Were they SC? Were they CR? Were they RC? We don't know. 
I'm pretty sure they're a CR because um, in Q1, I got no CRs and I realized that, like, mm. where are the CR questions? Interesting. Um, and then I remember getting on evaluate, accept, extremely text heavy CR question, which I immediately skipped because it's just so text heavy. I'm just not going to bother reading So you it. did that even in Q2? You immediately skipped? Yeah. Yeah. I think it was in Q2. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm being a bit fuzzy. Yeah, I think it is in Q2. Yeah, it is in Q2. And Q3, I started, I, I started guessing even more. Maybe because mm -hmm. maybe I, one of my eyes did go to the clock. I don't know if that caused a panic. But it's, uh, it's starting to get a bit fuzzy now. But I'm pretty sure that's what's going on. Pretty sure. Because the the four the four mistakes you made in Q two were totally irrelevant to your score. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like getting them right, getting them wrong, nobody cares. Doesn't matter. What when would somebody care about those four questions? If you were scoring in the forties in verbal, and it was a question of you know will you score forty one or forty four or forty five even then those four questions become more interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you're not there, and I'm not really sure that you need to be there, right? Because you're scoring a good, like, you know, a solid 48 in quant consistently. Uh, you're not trying to get a 760 on this test. You don't need to get in the 40s in verbal. And I think because you're not, inherently fast at verbal like some people are just fast at verbal you're not one of those people right but when you do take your time you can do quite well and i can see that just from looking at this you, you can do fairly well like you can get a 40 in verbal for sure it, with the right strategy because because you're able to do this remind me what was the verbal score on this one uh 35 35 yeah so i i can I would bet good money that you can get a V40 without even studying anymore. Like just with, just with tweaking um, your mindset and your approach and your strategy, you should be able to get a 40. And I say that just by looking at this picture that we're looking at here, right? Um, like if you look at the average difficulty level of those five questions that you got right in Q2, so that's that blue dot, right, in, in Q2, those are around 40 difficulty level, mm -hmm. around 40. And you got them all right, all of them, all five of them. And their average was that, so some of them were probably higher than that, right, because this is just an average. Some were lower, some were higher. On average, that was the difficulty level for those five questions. What pushed your score down from, let's say, 40, which is what I think you're... you're able to get right now to 35 what cost you those five points is those mistakes on the easy questions in q3 so if we scroll back up let's see how many such questions there were so four questions right so you got four questions wrong in q3 and the problem was not that it was four questions i mean there was also four questions wrong in q2 and we don't care about those four but these four in q3 they cost you they yeah. cost you. They're, they're the reason that you scored a 40, uh, 35 instead of a 40. Just those four questions. Yeah. I'm not tough to say whether those are SC, CR. I think those must be SC because maybe it is CR because uh, maybe I was guessing more aggressively on, I, if I have to guess, I guess on CRs. I mean, SCs, right? Because it's only a minute 20. We can kind of try to guess based on the fact that we know you had a total of 10 mistakes on the questions that counted. So how do I know you had a total of 10 mistakes? Because I could see from the percentages, you had four mistakes in Q2, four mistakes in Q3, and two mistakes in Q4. So Q4 had eight questions, and you got four, uh, six right, uh, two wrong. So a total of 10 mistakes. So if we scroll over to the percentages that you got correct in each category of question, we can kind of try to guess, right? So we have, like, I would guess that there were four of each in CR, and you made three mistakes and one mistake, right? So you, so you had four, four, so of your 10 questions wrong, four were CR, right? 
for reading comp, I can guess that there were six for the identify the inferred idea, right? Because you, you, you had one mistake out of six in identify the inferred idea. I'm just making educated guesses based on the percentages. Um, it's a bit harder to guess for identify stated, stated idea, but my best guess would be two right, two wrong there, which means you only had one mistake in sentence correction. Scroll down a bit to sentence correction. Yeah, so that's right. So, so I think I'm right. Let's write this down. I'm going to write it down here on a note. So we said, so I'm just counting the mistakes. Three in analysis critique, one mistake in construction plan, one mistake in identify inferred idea, and two mistakes in identify stated, stated idea, and then one mistake in communication. All right? So this is of the counted, of course, there's also the experimental questions, but of the counted questions, these were your mistakes. And I'm like 99% confident that these are right, like th these guesses are correct. So, so four mistakes in CR, three mistakes in RC, and only one mistake in SC. And I think it's not surprising, knowing you, you know, I've known you for a few years now, I'm not surprised that your mistake in SC was under the communication category rather than the grammar category. Mm -hmm. This is not surprising. Yeah. Um, I think it's very reassuring that you only had one mistake in SC on the entire test. That's great. Now, we don't know the difficulty level of that question, unfortunately. And as you know, that's the most important thing to know is how, how hard were each of these questions. We don't know that. But nevertheless, I think just for your own like self-esteem and confidence and stuff like that, like you should celebrate this. Like you've come a long way to be able to look at a verbal section on which you scored a 35, which is not a terrible score. Like 35 is, is a decent score for verbal. And on that section, the one which you scored 35, you only had one mistake in SC. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Like, is that better than you? thought you were yeah yeah especially on um I, I think this makes sense because whenever i have whenever i do verbal i tend to do a lot of scs i, I enjoy it a lot um mm. and because there's only you know just a minute 20 I, I you can do a lot more maybe whenever you have some free time as opposed to you know those huge chunky crs and rcs and I think that did pay off, um, you know, just on my, uh, I'm on my phone and I'm just doing some SCs as opposed to, you know, doing a lot of CRs. And yeah. uh, I, I'm, I can see that how this makes sense because I've done a lot more thinking and analysis on SC comparative to our CRs and uh, RCs. I can see, I think it's showing that pattern is showing that I've spent more time, much more time on SC. Just because it's um you know it's a bit quicker to get through and it's the I thought it was the easiest to if you want to improve it's the easiest to improve on compared to yeah, like CRs and RCs. I think that's right. And look, there's the other thing to celebrate here is when I look at the uh, average time you spent per question on SC, you were at a minute and thirty. Mm -hmm. Now I know they they you know Manhattan Prep and other experts say it should be a minute and twenty. I think a minute and 30 on average for SC, where you're getting only one mistake on a test that you scored 35, I think it's perfectly fine. I, I wouldn't change a thing. Um, I think some people might push you or encourage you to be faster in SC. I think that would be a mistake because that's going to cost you accuracy yeah. and it's going to cost you also um, your calmness, right? You're going to feel less calm if you're like, oh, I was told that I have to do this. No, you don't have to do it faster. I think a minute and 30 is appropriate. You're doing well. Keep that. Don't change that. Okay. Having said that, and what I'm about to say is, goes for everything, not just SC, everything across the board and the entire GMAT, if you feel stuck, if you feel like it's not going well, bail. Mm -hmm. And that's really the strategy that I would push you to to replace the strategy that you've been using on Q3. Just in general on the GMAT, if it's not going well, if you're if you're on a question and you're just feeling like 
I mean, you you are experienced enough at this point, JD, to know when it's not going well. Right? Mm-hmm. If you if you were a beginner in the GMAT world, then I would cut you some slack. I'd say, well, you know, you're inexperienced. You don't know. Maybe it's all overwhelming and you just can't tell. You just don't know. You don't have that intuition to tell you when it's not going well. But you're not a beginner. You like if you're honest with yourself, you know fairly quickly if a question is going your way or not. And I'm guessing and tell tell me if I'm wrong. Tell me if I'm wrong. But my guess is that you don't you you're not honest enough with yourself in the moment to cut your losses when a question isn't going your way. Like you could do better in that. Is that true or do you think I'm wrong about that? Um, so I actually think, Avi, it's the opposite because I think in Q3, at least from what I think I do, I think I'm bailing too fast maybe. That's why I got some easy questions wrong because why else... No, I agree with you that you're bailing too fast in Q3. That's what we want to change. But what I'm saying is, you're bailing too. F- the reason you feel like you have to bail too fast in Q3 is because in the rest of the test, uh-huh. you're not bailing fast enough. That was my point. Like, oh, I see you what were, you mean. If you were more honest with yourself, uh-huh. say on those, like if you scroll, wait a minute, where are we? I'm looking at my own copy of your ESR. I need to go back to Zoom to see what you're sharing. Uh, hang on. There we go. Uh, yeah, so if you, exactly. So go there. So if you look at the second quarter, go up, up a little bit and look at the red dot, that red dot in the second quarter, my point is that you weren't honest enough with yourself at that red dot, at those four hard questions in Q2, mm-hmm. you didn't let go of them as fast as you would have had you been more honest with yourself in identifying, hey, this question is not going well. Like, mm-hmm. I, I I, don't feel good about this question. And yet, I believe you kept going on that same question, even though you kind of already knew intuitively yeah. this wasn't going well. That's yeah. my point. I, I agree. I think that's absolutely true. Because in Q1 and Q2, I'm very relaxed. Yeah. And I, I, haven't... And I, I don't want to change that, by the way. I, I like that you're very relaxed. But you can still be like you can do both things at the same time. You can be relaxed and also honest. Mm-hmm, and I don't mm-hmm. know if honest is the right word. Like I'm not, I'm not trying to say that you're a liar. <laughs> but it, but do you know what I mean by honest? Like just honest with yourself. Of this question is just it doesn't feel good. So I'm just going to let go and move on. Okay. But still be relaxed. It's not a matter of losing that relaxed mindset. I don't want you to lose that. That's a very important mindset to have. But at the same time, you also want to be willing to let go of questions regardless of which quarter it's in. Like, that's the thing. I, I want you to take you out of that mindset of the the quarter is important. Like, I care whether it's Q1 or Q2 or Q3 or Q4. I don't care which quarter I am in. What I care about is how does the question that I'm looking at, or that's right in front of me on the screen, right in this moment, how's that question feeling for me? I'm, mm-hmm. I'm relaxed. I'm going slow. I'm trying my best. But every step of the way, I'm being honest with myself and checking with myself, how, how am I feeling on this question? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's, yeah. I think, the, the strategy that will get you to the 40 mm-hmm. in verbal because you're, I can see that you're capable. And by the way, I remember earlier I said, unfortunately, we don't know the difficulty level of that SC question that you got wrong. Well, I was wrong. We do know the difficulty level. And how do we know? If you scroll up a little bit, you'll see that you're 98th percentile in sentence correction, if you go up a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, there, there we are, oh, you just passed it. See, sentence uh-huh. correction, 98th percentile. Now we know that you had a mistake in sentence correction, in communication, and even with that mistake, you scored in a 98th percentile in sentence correction. What does that tell me? That mistake that you did make was in a question that was as hard as it gets. Like mm-hmm. that was not a mistake that we should say, oh man, JD, how could you get that wrong? That was not a hard, no, no. It was as hard as it gets. It was perfectly acceptable for you to get that one wrong, which means in my book, you had a perfect test when it comes to sentence correction. Yeah. I know you yeah. did make one mistake, but as far as I'm concerned, you made no mistakes. It was just a perfect section in terms of sentence correction. And so again, don't change anything in sentence. Like, don't try to be faster at sentence correction. You're just going to mess yourself up. 
Don't try to push yourself to pick an answer quicker. Just keep doing what you've been doing in sentence correction. No change required there at all. So where is the change required? In CR and RC, which I'm guessing, well, either four, either all four mistakes, or at least three of the four mistakes in Q2 were in uh, RC and CR. We know you only had one mistake in SC, right? So either three or all four of them were CR or RC. They were hard. We, can, we know they were hard, thanks to the ESR. And you didn't cut them fast enough. And the, the fact that you didn't cut them fast enough, that's what caused you to have to bail too quickly on questions that in hindsight were easy questions. Remember, there oh. were four easy questions in Q3. Yeah, yeah that you didn't even give those questions a chance. And why didn't you give them a chance? Because you gave too much of a chance to those four hard questions in Q2. And the only reason you gave those Q2 four questions a chance and those four Q3 questions not a chance, the only reason is because those were in Q2 and those were in Q3. And that's yeah. not a good enough reason. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we need to change. You can't let which queue you're in yeah. Yeah. impact your strategy. Your strategy should just be your strategy across the test. There's no different strategies depending on which quarter you're in. And yeah. that, that's yeah. what's going to unlock your potential, which, again, in my opinion, is around 40. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so um, Avi, um, I don't mind actually continuing this because I think, I don't know, do you, do you think there's more value if you just continue this or? Um, uh... I don't know that there's more value in continuing this specific conversation. Uh, there could be value in analyzing, say, a question that took you too long or that you go wrong, but that's stuff that we do in much cheaper circumstances for yeah. you anyway, right? We have a verbal uh, workshop coming up. That's a two-hour session. We have AMAs. Um, so I'm, I'm always very cognizant of, of people's budgets and, and of yeah. how expensive the coaching is. So, I, I mean, I leave that up to you. Value in continuing this conversation. I mean, if you have follow-up questions or if you, know, you want to like, try to get a better understanding of what exactly it is that I'm suggesting, if you feel unclear on it, then we can... Yeah. Certainly discuss that, but otherwise, I, I don't know that, we, that there's so, a value. Uh, I, mean, I think my strategy right now is just because I've spent so much more time on SC and I can see that I have got some positive results. My goal is to focus more on CR and RC. Just do just pick up the OG, uh, this um, pick up this book, uh, this uh, verbal review book, and just open it up and just do more questions on this. Uh, and, yeah. Just be more comfortable because I actually get excited doing SC or at least I think I can, if I get it wrong, I feel like, okay, I'm going to learn something new. Whereas mm, in CR yeah. and RC, I'm like, okay, I'm really not, just come on. And I think I want to get to that excited level when I do exactly. CRs and RCs. Do you think I'm just going to... And the other thing I would say there is also ask yourself every time you do one of those questions, like try to practice that that uh, assessment that self-assessment that i was describing earlier of how am i feeling on this question like if this was a question in the middle of my test is this a point where i would say ah, it's not worth my time move on right and uh and the reason that's useful to do is because then you're going to get into the habit of continuous self-assessment that's what i would call what i'm, I'm describing continuous so it's not like, oh, two, three minutes have gone by. How am I feeling? No, it's continuous. And you have to do that while still remaining calm and relaxed. So it's not easy to do, but you can practice that. So when you're doing these practice questions at home, incorporate into your, into your process a continuous self-assessment, honest self-assessment of how is this feeling? Now, obviously, you're not going to be doing that when you're reading the question stem or reading the argument, not not early on, but certainly when you're reading the answer choices, okay. right? Um, and both in critical reasoning and in reading comp, by the time you're reading the answer choices, you're probably already a minute and a half in. You should be. I mean, if if you're already reading the answer choices and you're still in the first minute, well, then you're doing something wrong. You shouldn't be reading the answer choices in the first minute. 
Um, so Avi, I, I do want to extend this. Uh, I, I, it's my, I feel like I do want to still have this conversation. Okay. So, uh, so I don't mind extending this, uh, if that's okay with you. Sure, yeah, that's fine. Because uh, if you don't have, if you have another uh, meeting, I can always put up at something else. Um, I'm good for another half hour. Usually. Okay. So we can okay. Just, in the end, we can prorate however many okay. minutes we did and okay. figure it out. So I just want to continue. So right now with my CR and RC and SC, I don't, I don't do any time. Uh, sometimes I take even, you know, I'm just thinking, sitting, putting my pen down and I'm thinking, okay, how do I do this? I know I didn't get it right. But sometimes after 15 minutes, it suddenly clicks on me and say, oh, that's the issue. That's the issue. And I feel like rather than going through the answer and saying, oh, okay, of course. Whenever I do that, it certainly helps my, my, my muscle building when it comes to logic. I much, rather, I much rather figure out the answer by myself, even, taking even half an hour if I have to. Absolutely. Uh, that's why I don't time myself. I don't, that's I why I don't time myself. But I don't think I can have that self-awareness, as you say, when I do, when I follow the strategy of, um, you I know, disagree. sometimes taking... <laughs> I, I agreed minutes. with everything you said up until that last statement. So I'm a big fan of not timing yourself. I'm a big fan of taking half an hour to think about the argument before yeah. looking up the solution. Big fan of all of that. That's the way to improve your reasoning 100%. Where I disagree is with your statement about how when doing the above, I can't also at the same time do a self-assessment as I go. I disagree. Why not? Why can't you? Um, you're thinking about the argument, right? I mean, as you're reading the argument, by the time you get to the end of the argument, you can ask yourself, do I get this argument? Like, do I understand, first of all, what is the point of this argument? In other words, what's the conclusion? And second of all, what is that conclusion based on? Right? In other words, what's the premise? Like, why would anybody believe this conclusion? It has to be based on something, right? So what's the premise? And third of all, why would someone disagree with this conclusion? In other words, because it's, there's got to be something wrong with the argument, otherwise it wouldn't be on the GMAT. So, so there are three things that you should be able to spot and, and articulate by the time you finish reading an argument. So what are those three things? Number one, what's the point, e.g. conclusion? Number two, why would anybody believe this conclusion? In other words, what's the premise? What is, the, what is this conclusion based on? And number three, why would someone not believe this conclusion? In other words, what's missing, right? What's the gap between the premise and the conclusion? What, what has the concluder failed to consider? Right. Uh, if it's uh, if the concluder is concluding some particular explanation for a surprising phenomenon, what did he fail to consider that there may be other possible explanations for the surprising phenomenon? Right? So, that, so that's a third item. So, again, what's the point? Why should anybody believe that point? And why would someone not believe the point? What's missing? So those are the three things that you have to be able to articulate when you finish reading an argument. And if you're not able to articulate all three of them, what does that mean? It means either you read the argument too quickly without pausing to digest what you're reading, or the argument was too hard for you, right? Your, your verbal reasoning is just not strong enough to, to, to receive this argument in a, in a thoughtful manner. Uh, or three, and this only goes for the, the third step, the what's missing, you're not creative enough. You're not thinking creatively slash critically enough about the argument because like identifying the point that you should be able to do regardless of how creative you are and, and how critical you are. Identifying why someone should believe that point, in other words, the premise, you should be able to do that as well without being creative or critical. But that third step, the what's missing, that can be... Uh, that is harder. That's the hardest part, right? Because that's something that's not stated. Mm -hmm. It's by definition not in there. Why do I say by definition it's not in there? Well, because it's missing. It's the missing piece. So the missing piece is not in there, right? And just by analogy, in case this is useful to you, on the quant side, if the question is talking about uh, the average of a set of numbers and the sum of that set, 
what's the missing piece? The number of terms. Terms, yeah. Yeah. And it's easier to notice the sum and it's easier to notice the average because those things are stated. But your inference about the number of terms, by definition, is not stated because if it were stated, it wouldn't be an inference. It would be stated. And this is, that's the game that we're playing on this entire test. Whether it's quant or verbal, doesn't matter. It's all reasoning. And what's, what's reasoning all about? It's about making inferences. It's about using the stuff that's on the screen in front of you to come up with things that are not on the screen in front of you, right? So in, our, in the quant example, it was the number of terms, which is not given. It's not on the screen, but we can infer it using the stuff that is on the screen. And in a critical reasoning argument, the premise is given, the conclusion is given, but what's not given is the things, all of the different things that the author failed to consider. In other words, all the assumptions that were made in drawing that conclusion from that premise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so that's the hardest part, and that's a part that does require some um, creativity slash uh, just being very critical, very... Um, almost like the conspiracy theorists that we have a lot of these days in the world mm -hmm. around us. Uh, you've got your flat earthers, of course, who believe the earth is flat, despite all evidence to the contrary. You've got your anti-vaxxers who are more afraid of the vaccine than they are of COVID. You've got a lot of people like that around. And not that I'm saying that it's good to be one of those people, but on the GMAT and critical reasoning, yeah, you kind of want to be that person who doesn't just believe what, uh, what the media tells you uh, and, you know, questions everything and says, well, yeah, they're claiming such and such, but what, what are they basing that on? All they're basing it on is this one premise. Uh, you know, what other explanations could there be? Or, you know, what are they failing to consider? Or what assumption are they making? That's the hard part in critical reasoning. And that's the third step. But if you can't do the first step, well, then you can't do the second step. And if you can't do the second step, then you certainly can't do the third step. So those steps are kind of built on top of one another. And that's what you want to be asking yourself in your self-assessment. Like when, when I get to the end of the argument, sh the, does it even make sense for me to read the answer choices if I couldn't do the first or second step? And the answer is no. Don't read the answer choices. There's no point. It's a complete waste of time to read the answer choices if I failed in step one or two. If I failed in step three, I will still read the answer choices. But before I go to the answer choices, I'll really sit with that failure. And I know you've heard me talk about this in the past, right? Where I'm it's like, damn, why am I not clever enough to see what the author is failing to consider? And I'm just not able to see what's wrong with this argument. It seems solid to me. Damn. I know it's not solid because it's on the GMAT, but I, I don't see what's wrong with it. And when I sit with that frustration then when I do get to the right answer, it smacks me in the face. It's like, oh, of course, that's the problem with the argument. And if nothing smacks me, and I've read the five answer choices, and nothing smacked me in the face, well, then I just guess and move on. So if I failed in step one or two, I don't even read the answer choices. I just guess mm -hmm. and move on. If I fail in step three, I sit with that failure for a bit, I feel that frustration, I read the answer choices once, if, if answer choice B smacks me, then I don't bother reading C, D, and E. If nothing smacks me, I guess and move on. So I'm, the fact that I failed in step three already preps me mentally to guess and move on, but I'll read the answer choices just to see if one of them smacks me in the face. Mm -hmm. But I'm ready, mentally I'm ready to guess and move on. If I failed in steps one or two, I'm not even reading the answer choices because it's a waste of time. I think sometimes where I do try, I think my big, normally I can identify the conclusion and the premise I've been doing this for a while now. And the, the pre-thinking or sometimes I, I, I understand it. Sometimes I'm looking, I, I don't pre-think so much. I, I, I think I know what I'm looking for. Something that, okay, what weakens this? Because I don't want to pigeonhole myself. Yeah. But I think, yeah, when I struggle to even understand what is going on in the conclusion or, you know, sometimes they have those negatives or something like that, and I still give it a shot, I think that's when it really, um, I don't think it makes any sense to even read the answer choices, I guess. Exactly. Exactly. And that, I believe, will enable you 
to throw away your Q3 strategy because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you'll do this instead. Yeah, and that, yeah. I think, is a much better approach because, again, remember, what killed you here, and if you scroll down a little bit, is those four easy questions that you got wrong in Q3. And, you know, interestingly, the two questions that you got wrong in Q4 were also easier. Look at that. Those two questions that you got wrong in Q4 are easier than the questions that you got right in Qs 2, 3, and 4. Like all of the blue dots in Q2, Q3, Q4, all those blue dots are higher than that red dot or pink or whatever the color is on, on Q4. Do you see? Do you notice that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So even though you were very relaxed in Q4 and where you were taking your sweet time, you still made two errors uh, that, that were in questions that were easier than all of the questions. On average, it's all averages, but on average, they were easier than all the questions that you got right in Qs 2, 3, and 4. And that... That is something that, that I think is unexpected, right? You, you can explain what happened in Q3 by describing the strategy that you were using, which again, we, we talked about and you said you shouldn't use it going forward. But that strategy doesn't explain those two mistakes in Q4. Yeah. And I would again guess there that either it was some kind of fatigue. I'm pretty sure it's the timing because I know it clocked Q4 last flight. I, I, I want to quickly move on that. You know, the moment yeah. I get a hiccup, the moment I have to think, even for an extra five seconds, where I have to put down my pen and think, mm, I, I'm just moving on because I'd much rather just get to the get, get to the end. I I don't want to. I don't want to miss on any easy question, and yeah. to me, easy means I can read it on on one go. Don't need to even think too much. Or when I mean too much, I don't need to pause and info so much as opposed to, you know, where you have to pause info, pause info, pause info. I just want to be able to get, get to it. And I'm just, because I know I'm much, I don't want to, I'm just at this point, just guessing without any pause and inferencing. The mo uh, if I don't have to pause and info, I'm doing it. If I have to pause and info in the question stem or to understand the conclusion or the premise, that's when I'm just guessing, uh, quickly guessing, uh, moving on. I'm not, I'm not even sometimes reading the answer choices. I'm pretty sure that's what's going on there. But where was that thinking on these four questions? It, it, was, it wasn't on those two because those are Q1 and Q2. That's the problem. So yeah. I, I, I need you to have a consistent strategy across all four sections. What should that strategy be? What you need to do is find the, the sweet spot between the strategy that you were using in Qs 1 and 2 and the strategy that you were using in Qs 3 and 4. There's a sweet spot in between where I don't throw away any question, right? I don't throw away any question, but I also don't stubbornly try to solve questions when I can sense that they're not going well. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm. If I sense that they're not going well, that's where I want to be very quick and just pick, like, don't even overthink it. Just pick B, whatever. It doesn't matter. Just pick B and move on. Don't overthink it. Go, you got to really cut your losses very quickly once you've established that, hey, this question isn't going well. And again, remember, JD, the only way to truly establish that is to give that question a fair chance. So... Yes, you're reading it very slowly. Yes, you're pausing to make inferences. Yes, you're pausing to digest. Yes, you're pausing to see if you've correctly identified what is the conclusion and what's the premise. Now, if you've established that you were not able to identify one of those things, be and move on immediately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you weren't doing that in Q1 and 2. And so you had to be overly aggressive in three and four. Yeah. And what we want is a consistent strategy that doesn't care which queue you're in. And that's really the mistake. The minute you let the, the, your place in the test dictate your strategy, you've handed over all of the power 
to the GMAT. Now you're not in charge anymore. Now the GMAT is dictating for you which questions you're throwing away instead of you telling the GMAT which questions you're going to throw away. Does that make yeah. sense? I think, yeah, that, that to me is Q1, Q2. I have a much more, diff I have a little more, I'm willing to give a question a more chance. Whereas in Q3 and Q3, I'm not willing to give any question any chance. I'm the moment I pause an in info, I, I'm thinking in Q3 and Q4, just is, it's too hard for me, just move on. Whereas in Q1 and Q2, I'm willing to give even an extra five seconds or 10 seconds. And I think it's all building up. And then in Q3, I, I immediately shift that strategy because it's Q3 and Q4. And I'm pretty sure that's what happened. I, I went I, extremely aggressive in Q3. In Q4, I was a bit more relaxed because I was so aggressive in Q3, but I'm still, you know, I'm still putting some, maybe one or two questions. I, I'm still applying that strategy. And I think it was all for CR because I know CR takes the most time per question. What, what this makes me think of is uh, when you ask a child, who do you love more, mom or dad? And if the child is a, a good politician, he'll say, I love them both the same amount. Mm -hmm. So in mm -hmm. this analogy, you know, you've got the first half of the section and you've got the second half of the section. Like, who do you love more, the first half or the second half? And your answer should be, I love them the same amount. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. love one more than the other. But the way you did this test is you loved the first section very much, too much. Yeah. yeah. And you didn't love the second half of the section at all. You need to love them equally. Yeah, yeah. I think I don't like it because I know the count, the clock is ticking. Also, my third, I think around Q3, I do take one look at the countdown. I do take one look because, um, I mean, it is Q3 and Q4. It's around question 20. I do take one look and I think that's all, it's all that, it's all building up within me. Just quickly move on, just quickly move on faster than what I would do in Q1 and Q2. I think that's what's showing here. I think that's what's showing you. Absolutely. And, and I want to share with you, for me, when I'm doing any kind of standardized test, whether it's the GMAT or the LSAT or back in the day when I did the Israeli SATs, when I'm looking at a question, that question is the only thing that exists in the world. There's no previous question. There's no next question. There's no question number, right? What, what number is this question out of how many? None of that exists. All there is is me and that question. But I'm not stubborn. If the question isn't going well, well, then I move on to the next one. And no big deal. But I'm giving it my best shot. And it doesn't matter whether it's question number one or question number 30. Or question number 20 like the question number doesn't matter i know for a lot of people they go into the test feeling i must get the first question right there's a very very strong psychological hang-up i know you don't have that but for a lot of people that's a, a real thing right where they they will not under any circumstances let go of question number one and i know you don't do that but what you are doing is a variation of that Right, like you're the the attachment that people have for question number one, you have that attachment for the first half of the section. Yeah. Right, and then you don't have that attachment for the second half of the section. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And what we need to release you of is your uh, attention on the question number or like which half of the section am I on? It's irrelevant. All that matters is you and the question in front of you. And that's the only things that exist in the world. I don't have the time or the attention span to be thinking about where, I'm, where I am in the greater context of this section or greater context of this test or greater context of my career. Some people in the middle of the GMAT are thinking, oh, which business school am I going to end up going to? And uh, you know, what kind of job will I get coming out of there? I'm like, dude, you're in the middle of the GMAT. Why are you thinking about all that unrelated stuff? Mm -hmm. but it's the same thing when you're thinking, wait, am I in the first half or the second? Who cares which half you're in? Can you do the question in front of you in a GMAT appropriate kind of manner? Yes or no. Give it your best shot. And if it's not working well, then move on to the next one. And that's that. In a way, it's easier on the GMAT because in other standardized tests, you can go back and forth in, among the questions. 
Uh, like on the LSAT, you know, you can go 10 questions backwards and change your answer and stuff like I that. See. So I see. So when you move on to the next question on the LSAT, you haven't really moved on, right? And, and that in a way makes it harder to forget about the previous questions and just focus on the one in front of you because you know that you can still go back and change your answer. The GMAT makes that a lot easier. The fact that they don't let you go back, in my, in my opinion, is a blessing because okay. you, can, you can for real psychologically scratch out everything that happened up until now and all there is is you and the question in front of you if it's going well great if it's not going well also great pick something and move on but don't have a different strategy depending on where you are in the section don't even think about where you are in the section it's not interesting to know where you are in the section okay so that's really the advice i think okay. so i think my takeaway is keep my goal is to have a more uh, uniform strategy across I think right now I will be doing more CRRC. I, I do want to keep my SC, so I will maybe do a question or two, but my goal is to do. Regarding time sets, I'm, um, I, I'm, 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 I generally avoid time sets. I detest yeah. them because me too. It's, it's, it's pointless if you ask me. It yeah. just forces me to, maybe I can, I, I don't do time sets. And I don't think I'm going to be doing those time sets in my view. Agreed. Uh, regarding quant, I think I, I, I keep going through your book. I, I just, and my goal is just to be able to, I, I don't, so, well, I don't know. My quant, I, I'm happy with the Q48, uh, Q48-ish. I don't really want to improve that. But I think, I think one issue that I did have was algebra. I don't know what, what is, I mean, they need, uh, I think that was the lowest algebra. Yeah. So I don't care about geometry. Mm -hmm. but arithmetic and algebra what what kind of que those algebraic questions is that just those x squared plus x something like that is that what algebra is in the yeah. context of the gmat yes yes okay okay yeah. yeah i think my goal is not to i i i think given your amas and just going through your previous amas and just being able to uh just go to the concepts i think that's my that's my entire thing really that's how I, I, I really agree with, uh, with all of these bullet points here. Um, I'll just remind you, we, we did one AMA on LCM and one AMA on GCF somewhat recently, and they're both on YouTube. So re-watching those could be good uh, to kind of deepen your conceptual understanding of LCM and GCF. Um, and for standard deviation, all of that is complete in my book. GCF and LCM I didn't get to yet in my book, but standard deviation we have... I take two shots at standard deviation, one from the additive reasoning perspective and a second one from the multiplicative reasoning perspective. That one just came out a couple of weeks ago um, in the book. But that's that standard deviation is really conceptual on the GMAT. There's because nobody needs to know how to compute a standard deviation for the GMAT. Mm -hmm. But you need to know mm -hmm. what it measures kind of conceptually. So in some in some way, you'd say it's harder than learning yeah. how to compute it. Learning yeah. how to compute it is an algorithm. You just execute and you're done. But understanding conceptually what it's measuring, that's a much more interesting thing to test, and that's what they're testing. So um, I would say reading those parts, especially in the multiplicative reasoning section, reading about standard deviation there should really be all you need to okay. conquer any standard deviation question on the GMAT. Uh, and then inequalities, you know, it's all about the number lines, uh, rates and fractions and almost every word problem are really just ratio questions where you can build a, either an additive ratio or multiplicative ratio and uh, figure it all out. Uh, that's really all ratios, ratios, ratios. Even a lot of the algebra is ratios. Uh, there are questions in this last chapter that I published uh, if you look at the video solutions for the OG questions at the end of the chapter, you'll see some surprising stuff where it looks like just an algebra inequality question, but then in the solution video, I start talking about a mixture of two ratios and how the mixture has to be somewhere in between the two tick marks on the number line, and that actually solves the question without even really putting pen to paper, just understanding, hey, the answer, well, I mean, I might put pen to paper to draw the number line, but that's about it, and this, what looked like an algebra inequality question was actually a mixture of two ratios question. And it's very easy to solve if you, uh, if you view yeah. it as such, if you view yeah. it as a mixture of two ratios. 
I think my only follow up, just going back to CR. I think right now my goal is just to do more CRs. Right now, push, try to bring that, bring CR and RC, and hopefully I'll get more comfortable with it because I'm, I really, I'm pretty comfortable with SC. When I mean comfortable, I mean I enjoy it. I, I really get yeah. to the point where I feel like I'm learning something. You know, oh crap, I forgot. I didn't understand how to like. What's the meaning of what's the author trying to get them trying to. Understand? Okay, how could I have used meaning perhaps to get this as sequel? I don't get that enjoyment with uh, CRs, and I think my goal is to be able to perhaps be more cognizant of okay, here's the conclusion, here's the premise. Why couldn't I think of this assumption? I think uh, I, I think that's how my goal is to enjoy CRs, as to be able to see how the authors may make maybe making this assumption or something. Yeah, and I and I also encourage you in RC to really ask yourself, like, read it very, very slowly and ask yourself for each word. I'm not talking about the detail words, but I'm talking about words like only, despite, although, mm-hmm. you know, the words that we talk about whenever we talk about RC, those kind of meaningful words that give you a window into the author's brain, every word has a reason for being there. So you really need to be thinking about, huh, I wonder why the author chose to use this particular word as opposed to some other word. What does this tell me about how the author is thinking about the subject matter and his reason for writing this passage in the first place? Because that's really the question that we must ask ourselves yeah. throughout. And, and the same goes for CR and SC, right? Every mm-hmm. word there has a reason for being there. What is that reason? Why did the author choose to use that word? That's how I got good at RC. I, so I used to be absolutely terrible at RC. That was my Achilles heel. Everything else, I was, I was naturally good at CR. I was naturally good at SC. I've obviously naturally been good at quant. RC was just by far and away my weakest. And how I got good at it is by reading the passages very slowly and really wondering to myself with every word, Again, not the details, but just the, the kind of the big picture words. Why is that word here? What's it, what's the purpose of this word? Why did the author choose to use it? And that's why I got better at it. If you look at this RC, I actually noticed that it. I'm actually better on inferences, which just surprised me personally, as opposed to de- the details. Maybe I, because I do, um, I, I do follow the strategy on the Manhattan. Remember the RC that you did in the Manhattan one? That to me yeah. is really. So I do, whenever it's detailed, I just skip, skip, skip. And I think what must have happened was maybe I skipped and I, because normally stated ideas, I think are essentially mentioned in the passage. Yes. They're not necessarily a detail though. What I've found is that even the stated ideas tend to be, more often than not, they tend to be a bigger picture thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And even if it is, content specific there are different levels for the content like some of the content will be there as an example of something which would be a higher level i'm I'm imagining a hierarchy of details of you know different levels of of stuff you've got your bottom bottom level of the hierarchy which would maybe be a specific example of some idea so then the idea itself is a level above that but maybe the reason the author presented that idea was in order to support his opinion. So then his opinion is a level above that. So the question will tend to be not about the example and not about the idea, but about the opinion that is based on the idea. And here's the example for that idea. They tend to focus, uh, unlike the LSAT, so the LSAT is going to be a lot more interested in the bottom levels of the hierarchy of this pyramid. On the GMAT, they're much more interested in the higher levels, which makes sense if you think about what the GMAT is testing and what the LSAT is testing. They're tests for very different types of professions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. LSAT is for lawyers, and lawyers have to be all about attention to detail and really observing every single word in the contract because one word is going to come bite you in the ass when, when you're in court, right? GMAT is for a very different type of profession. It's much more big picture strategy kind of thinking. Um, and so it makes sense that the GMAT reading comprehension is very different from LSAT reading comprehension in that it's not as interested in the lower levels of the hierarchy. So I find that almost always the 
most detailed chunks I never have to go back to. I, you know, I, I go through all of the questions, even in the OG, where you'll have sometimes eight questions for a single passage, unlike the test where you'll only have three or four. You have eight questions in a single passage, and yet I solved all eight of them without going back to read this half a paragraph that was just super detailed. Wow. That wouldn't happen on the LSAT. Also, mm -hmm. in the LSAT, you'll have seven questions. On the test itself, you have seven questions for the passage, Mm -hmm. and some of them will be really on the very bottom levels of the hierarchy. And so that's much harder, mm -hmm. uh, at mm -hmm. least for me it is. Uh, the GMAT is easier in that it's really more about the bigger picture stuff, even for the detailed questions. Yeah. So uh, you're right, that stated idea questions do have the answer literally in there in the passage. It's just a matter of going to find what that answer is. But it's also true that the four trap answers will be in the passage as well. Mm -hmm. if all five answer choices will be in the passage. And I think what happens a lot with people is they go searching for the answer in the passage and they find one of the answer choices in the passage and they pick it, not realizing well, just because it's in the passage doesn't mean that's the answer to this particular question that is being asked. So it's very important to match the answer choice to what they're actually asking. And I think that's where a lot of times people don't pay enough attention. They just pick something that's in the passage, but that's actually not answering this particular mm -hmm. question that was being asked. So keep that in mind. All five answer choices are going to be in the passage. Don't get too excited just because you found the answer in the passage. That's not a good enough reason to pick it. All five of them will be in there. But what is the question asking for specifically? And I actually like, more often than not, I like to go search for the answer to that particular question in the passage before I read the answer choices, yeah, yeah, right? Because yeah. if I read the answer choices first, uh, it's wasteful because maybe the correct answer choice is A, and I just read B, C, D, E for no good reason. But more importantly, I didn't just waste time. I'm also now much more vulnerable to picking the wrong answer okay. because okay. I've actually seen all five of them. But if I first of all try to answer the question myself by finding the answer to it in the passage, now it's just a matter of picking out the five answer choices, picking out the one that I already identified myself ahead of time and move on. So it's, a, it's also a much faster way of doing it. M more, it's faster and it's more accurate. Okay. I know you have another appointment on me, so I think I'll cut it. But thank you so much. I'll send over the, uh, the 175 for the extra half an hour. Thank you so much for this meeting. It really helped me. I just wanted someone to just get, give, give me a sense. And I think my goal is just to go do some RCs, CRs, and do SCs and um, quant as well, just so that I keep it up. But I, I think that's where my focus should be, hopefully. I agree. And uh, I mean, if I'm right that you can get a Q48 V40, uh, would that be, would that make you happy? Like that would be a... Yes, I'm, I'm looking, yeah. trying to kind of breathe. I'm only trying to get a 710, 720-ish. Keeping yeah, that it's Q usually a 710. A Q48 V40 is a 710 most times. Um, so, yeah. So, I, and again, I 100% think you're already, like even without any additional studying, you could get a Q48 V40 with the right strategy and of course assuming you're having a good day and okay. you had a good yeah. night's sleep the night before etc yeah. uh, and that should translate into a 710 more often than not okay thank you so much and, and by the way if you get a v42 mm -hmm. which i think is possible if you're continuing to work hard on rc and cr and uh working on them the way that you were describing where you'll take a half hour just to think about it etc uh, then I think you could get a Q48 V42, and that tends to translate into a 740. Oh. So, so just here, there's a goal for you, right? I mean, yeah. it's it's not out of reach in my opinion, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but certainly you should be scoring in the 700s, no question. So, uh, I'm glad that you're not giving up and you're continuing to work on it. And uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll see you around. Okay, thank you so much, Avi. All right, thank you. My pleasure, JD. Have a good Have one. You. you too. Bye bye.